This is 5 and 10 from Skywatch TV for Thursday, April 11th, 2024. I'm Derek Gilbert, joined by a special guest today who can shed some insight on some questions we have regarding the situation between Israel and the proxies of Iran, with which it's been in conflict since, well, for a very long time, but especially since October 7th of last year. He uh, was born in Iran and uh, began a spiritual journey after the Shia revolution of 1979 that culminated in 1991 with him accepting Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He now operates a multimedia teaching ministry and in 2006 released the documentary film USO, UFOs, Gods, excuse me, UFOs, Angels and Gods about the UFO phenomenon, which features uh, such uh, luminaries as the late uh, Dr. Chuck Missler. So we welcome back to the program to uh, help us understand what Iran hopes to gain out of all of this is uh, our friend Ali Siadatan. Ali, uh, Israel is faced on multiple fronts, south and north, with uh, proxies for the government in Iran, Hamas in the south, in the Gaza Strip, and of course Hezbollah, and other uh, Shia militia proxies in Syria along its northern border. There are some 60,000 Israelis who are still not able to go home at this point, living in hotels. Many of the areas that we would normally visit on our tours of Israel in the north, um, Tel Dan, the, the Grotto of Pan, or Banyas, uh, Mount Hermon, uh, are just off limits because you can't get there safely at this point. Uh, last week, Israel struck the Iranian consulate in Damascus, killing a couple of high-ranking officials within the Revolutionary Guard Corps. And uh, in response, Iran has promised a very, a very muscular uh, well, consequences, some, some uh, deadly consequences for Israel. That shoe has not yet dropped. Um, what is Israel, or what is Iran, rather, planning at this point, do you think? And what, is, what are their goals? What are they trying to accomplish here by using its proxies to strike at Israel? Uh, yes. Great question. So Israel's strike was very strategic. They hit Unit 2000 of the Quds Force, which was the unit responsible for managing the Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Gaza and and opening a second front from the north. Uh, the Supreme Leader's connection to the northern front went through that office. Um, they also hit the um, uh, people in charge of intelligence and logistics. Um, in order to open a second front, um, there are logistic requirements of fueling the army and the oil has to come, uh, well, it can come from Syria. They're, they control some oil fields in Syria. But the closest oil field that it could supply um, comes from Al Ambar in Iraq. Um, so Israel was taking a strategic hit it was, it was, you know, at, at the uh, people in charge of masterminding the Northern Front, managing the Gaza War. And the very day, the very next day, in official Iranian news, uh, government controlled uh, news, they said that. Uh, the General Zaidi, who they killed, was in fact in char uh, had a hand in planning October 7th. So whether they were just saying that to look good or whether they were saying that because it was true, it's hard to tell. Um, so it was a very strategic strike and it has created a conundrum for the Supreme Leaders. Usually there's a playbook when it comes to responding to these things. One is you hit something insignificant, um, you leverage it to negotiate with the United States for concessions, and you continue to build uh, your Islamic army and, and, and move forward for the ultimate battle. That's usually the playbook. Um, in this case, um, the, um, the situation is, is, is as it is. The economy of the country um, is very weak. It has taken a nose dive mainly because of the collapse of the money. When Donald Trump took, uh, pulled out of the JCPOA, the Iranian uh, real currency took a nosedive, and it just hasn't stopped, and it just the nosedive became sharper and sharper. So even when the strike happened in Damascus, it went to an all-time low. Um, you need 65,000 units of Iranian currency to get one U.S. dollar, at the time of the 1979 revolution, when the king was there, you needed seven. Hmm. You needed wow. seven units of Iranian currency to get a U.S. dollar. Now you need 65,000. So it's been a, a, a the, this end. And most the country runs mainly on imports. It's very weak on production. It has like um, cattle and farming, but it, but it imports virtually everything else. 
other than dairy and basic eating. Um, so you have to buy everything on the international market uh, through U.S. dollar, which has created over 40% inflation uh, at a time where the world is undergoing inflation, 40%. Um, so in, uh, I think inflation peaked at 7% in the United States before it withdrew, uh, just to give you kind of a difference. So basically, they, they don't have the economic strength for uh, a right-out war with Israel, because if Israel is struck and Israel strikes back, if Israel territory is struck, um, they don't have the um, military technology, unless there's some secret weapon that we don't know about. They don't have the military technology to defend against Israel's missiles, meaning that they could throw a missile. It's not sure that it would get through because Israel has uh, some very serious defensive systems. It has four layers of ground defense, the Patriot system being the least, but even that alone should be able to stop Iran's missiles. And then when Israel strikes back with its Jericho missiles, um, Iran has no defense. So they don't have the military technology to go head to head with the state of Israel. And they don't have the military doctrine for an all-out war. So they don't have the economy, the military uh, technology or doctrine. And Nasrallah, who acts as a mouthpiece um, in his speech for the supreme leader, the idea is to delegate to his uh, uh, generals and uh, you know, like Nasrallah and other people the war language so that he can remain aloof and above it in order to leverage this for negotiations with the great powers. You know, maybe if you throw me a bone that's big enough, I can chew on that and, you know, play this down. So Nasrallah said that the resistance, as they call themselves, the jihadis, the movement, um, their attack, their style of warfare was asymmetric. Um, so this is kind of, you know, the, the, the picture as far as the capabilities. Um, and now as far as what is happening internally in the country, uh, in the corridors of politics, this is where the first conundrum has appeared for the supreme leader. Over the years, he has fomented a radical base, a populist radical base, that's also very ideologically driven in order to push down his enemies in the political system because he rules through a series of alliances. Um, he has to align with other people in the system that have centers of power in order to maintain his power. It's, it's, he's, not a, he's a dictator, but it's not like you know the uh, you know the type of dictator where alone he just rules supreme above everyone and everything, and so his base that he's created to be radical are now asking for blood suddenly because in a way that's their programming, so they're saying basically that this this time a building of the Islamic Republic was hit. It's not a proxy. It's not a mercenary. We can't kind of hide behind these things and. Well, they have to kind of decide where the line is in the balance of power in these two regional powers between Iran and Israel. If 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 they they don't show anything, then the the people are saying the supreme leader clearly Israel showed that it it had great intelligence. It knew where you know our most secretive meetings were, and it was able to strike it from eighty kilometers away uh, from the Golan Heights through a jet without destroying the buildings next to it. So that kind of a precision is real signaling they can hit Tehran. It can hit the uh, the generals in Tehran. And so the his, his the people that are around him are saying to him, I'll just give you a few quotations so you get a mood of what he's dealing with in his own base, in his political base. Um, uh, it, the, another factor that might force Khamenei to respond differently this time is genuine anger among his followers already uneasy about his refusal to back Hamas in the Gaza war? How much longer should we wait for the promised hard revenge to happen? Demands Ebrahim Azizi, vice chair of the National Security Committee in the Islamic Consultative Assembly, the Majlis, which is essentially the parliament of Iran. And the word Majlis, it comes from the word Magi, actually, because they were advisors of the kings of Persia. Okay. Announcing the sending of a special mission to Damascus to see what happened, Majdas spokesman Musawi takes, says taking revenge is a national demand that cannot be ignored. The head of the, the official news agency, which is considered the second army in Iran, that's what Iranians call it, um, because the supreme leader controls the army and the media, and with these two he rules the nation. That's the understanding. So the, the head of his 
uh, media army said the whole nation demands revenge um, and suggesting that embassies and consulates of the Zionist enemy in several countries are ready targets for revenge. And, and I could read many more uh, prominent uh, leaders and key people from the clergy, from the army, from the parliament, each echoing the same thing. That So his base is suddenly asking for blood. Usually he would have just played it down, hit something insignificant, like after Soleimani's death, said we'll continue to build and negotiated with America for a concession. This time, this is first his first conundrum. He doesn't want to appear weak to his base as he's putting together his legacy plan. He wants his son, it seems, to take over, and he's systematizing the ideals of the revolution through uh, administrative schools that are also theological schools and all kinds of other things that bring the ideals into the system rather than depend on a person. He's a, Maybe you know, if he's too weak, then he'll start to lose his base and they'll gravitate towards another leader. Um, on the other hand, he understands the situation of the country, technological... Uh, military deficiencies uh, and the weak economy and of course 90 percent of the country doesn't support the war uh, at most 10 percent would and so he doesn't have enough popular support to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with israel so that's his first conundrum he's caught between his base pushing and, his, and this reality so he began to put out immediately a response to this publicly he made it a public conversation um his chief of staff of the IRGC came immediately on television and said, look, uh, yes, there of course will be a response, but it'll be on our timing. We, we have to strategize, c calculate, and strike at a time that is good for us. Um, and uh, he, the supreme leader himself, uh, Khamenei is his name, he said Netanyahu is baiting me into a war. If I strike directly at Israel, America will strike at us. And he wants America to get involved in the war, and the only way he can do that is to bait me to strike Tel Aviv from Tehran, and I won't take the bait. So he, he so he's trying to get ahead of it. Other people came and said, look, uh, right now is Iranian New Year, and, and there are so many trips registered at the airport, so people are living their lives in relative peace, traveling, the economy is down, but still standing. Is this not itself revenge enough, he said, this other government official. Uh, so suddenly he see, he made it a public conversation, you know, um, and there are other stories that I could tell you about, the. but I'm just giving you kind of a general perspective of the mood. And so that's his first conundrum. His second conundrum is usually he would, you know, the Strait of Hormuz, where 70% of the oil of the world moves through uh, in the Persian Gulf is right there. And of course, Iran is always able to squeeze that. Uh, by um, maybe blowing it up, which is more of an Armageddon scenario for them if America attacks full on, and they will like collapse the world's economy and energy, or other things such as seize ships in a meaningful way and, and really push on the energy and push oil north of $100 a barrel uh, affect the election outcome. But the conundrum is, do you really want to sink Biden's electoral uh, hopes when on the other side you get Trump? And would you rather have the progressive left in the United States in power or Donald Trump? Um, this is, becomes the second conundrum um, when it comes to that. So that, that's another issue. Um, now, of course, it seems because of the push and the fact that you know a line has to be drawn, um, that this time around we're getting the impression that there will be a response. Now, what that response is going to look like um, it looks like there's going to be con uh, seizure of ships, um, the Houthis um, in um, Yemen. the Red Sea. Yep. Um, j just, I don't know uh, uh, <clears throat> the, if you're aware of this, but uh, it just happened within the hour. The Houthis just seized, um, uh, so let me read it to you. Iran-backed Houthis of Yemen have, attached, have attacked two Israeli vessels. MSC Gina and MSC Darwin, an American vessel, Maresk Yorktown, and a U.S. warship in the Gulf of Aden, the Houthi spokesman said Wednesday. And then America and United Kingdom responded immediately. Uh, intensive airstrikes by U.S.-U.K. coalition targets the Horiba International Airport in Yemen. So this is part of the seizure of ships in energy lines and supply lines. Asymmetric warfare, um, so through the militias, targeting you know, things through the militias. 
one possibility is that they will strike a a consulate of the of the Israel. That is one thing that is being thrown around. Whether that's going to be one where they first warn where they're going to strike, so the civilians the, can vacate and they just take down the building as a symbolic gesture, um, uh, and and then that'll be end. That'll be it. Or are they actually going to kill uh, the consular um, you know staff of Israel? That's another question, and of course, which one would they target? Um, originally, the, the thought was it would be Jordan, because the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood through Qatar, and, and they are trying to overthrow the Hashemite Kingdom right, and right. foment rebellion in Jordan, open a second front through the West Bank. They're supplying the West Bank with weapons through Afghanistan, the, the United States left behind, and they have contacts in Fatah that are receiving those. So the idea is that um, um, they might hit Jordan, the the con but that might actually you know be too much. So now people are thinking Lebanon, um, about ten miles from the uh, Iranian border. There is of course the Israeli consulate in Turkmenistan, which is a stronghold of Islamists as well. Um, so that's another option. But that is the, as far as striking. Um, are they going to throw some drones as softballs towards Elat, uh, more of a symbolic thing that the navy of Israel will easily take down. Um, but once they do decide that beyond piracy, um, what they're going to start hitting, I, I assume it will come with a salvo of missiles from the north. They will, like, turn everything on. They'll say to Hezbollah, strike. Uh, then they will take down the targets that they have chosen. It just, you know, it, it seems to be logistics targets and installations, maybe a consulate. Um, and um, I think that he said that he was not going to attack until the end of Ramadan, which which was today. He went and did the prayer. He led the prayer himself in Tehran, and um, and and then he said that Israel um, needs to be punished and will be punished. And then the camera shifted to the head of the air force, who was smiling. Uh, so. The um, there is something coming this time. That's the feeling, but n I don't think it'll be enough to escalate the situation to a right out war. Just because I said they're not ready for it, mm. it'll be an asymmetric mm. response. And um, their ultimate strategy is to make Israel look like the oppressor, and them, you know, like the savior, and continue to build a transnational Islamic army with the Muslim Brotherhood. Even though we really have to remind everybody that. It is the forces of radical Islam that are the oppressors of many people in, in the region. And it is right. Israel that's liberating the people of Gaza from the dark rule of Hamas. And hopefully this is the beginning of the entire Middle East is taken hostage, actually, by this radical Islamist force. And perhaps this is an allegory, the freeing of the hostages, that, that God is about to free the Middle East from this darkness. We shall see. Uh, we shall see. Yeah. Oh, amen. Ali, we'll have to leave it there. I know this only scratches the surface, but uh, we, we uh, do this program in, in small bite-sized chunks so that people can fit it into their busy days. And I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to uh, share some insight with us. And uh, straight ahead, we will uh, tell you how you can join us in our arm-in-arm -arm solidarity mission to Israel as 5 and 10 continues. We want to make sure that you know how you can get your copy of this incredible new book in the Summoning the Demon Super Collection. This amazing collection includes Dr. Thomas Horn's final book, Summoning the Demon, Artificial Intelligence and the Image of the Beast, that reveals how tech singularity will bring an all-powerful artificial mind to life. The trigger event that will make 666 the mark of the beast mandatory overnight. What the future of a marked society will look like. The new face of transhuman supernatural warfare and how Christians must prepare for what is coming. But this incredible collection also includes, for a limited time, the brand new Dr. Thomas Horn Definitive Skywatch TV Collection. This unimaginable and historical TV anthology is valued at $99.95 all by itself. It contains a total of 96 episodes, 
over 45 hours of content on eight DVDs and is not available anywhere else or online. And includes classic series like Zenith 2016, The Milieu, Belly of the Beast, Saboteurs, The Wormwood Prophecy, The Messenger, Zeitgeist 2025, Legion, and more. But we're still not finished. You'll also receive Trajectory, Tracking the Approaching Tribulation Storm. This unprecedented masterpiece by legendary authors Dr. Thomas Horn, Terry James, Tim Moore, and others provides in-depth analysis of emerging topics like pandemic tidal waves, catastrophic weather changes, Mideast malevolence, and so much more. This unprecedented collection sold separately holds a retail value of over $140. Yours now for your donation of only $39.99 plus shipping and handling. So don't delay. You can scan the QR code on your screen right now using the camera app on your phone for instant access to this special collection. You can also visit us at skywatchtvstore.com or call 1-844-750-4985 and ask for the Summoning the Demon Super Collection, now. The other aspect about the situation in Iran that's very curious are the uh, protests that have taken place in recent days with young people taking to the streets and shouting death, death to Palestine because they don't want to get involved in a war for people who are not of their ethnic group. Uh, there, There is a very significant difference between Persians and Arabs, and they don't necessarily like one another. And of course, Shia Muslims and Sunni Muslims, although many of the young people who are protesting are rejecting the Shia religion of the Ayatollahs and wanting to go back to a sort of a nationalistic religion based on Zoroastrianism. And of course, this is also opening the door for the gospel to be shared in Iran, which is happening. And we pray that it continues. Uh, we will be closely watching this situation as that uh, situation in the Middle East obviously has the potential to explode into something much wider. And of course, anytime you're talking about war in the Middle East, you're dealing with prophetic consequences or implications as well. So keep watch on Skywatch TV and uh, thank you for watching and subscribing if you're watching on YouTube at 5 in 10 on X, also at 5 underscore in underscore 10 for uh, updates as they are available. Well, Skywatch TV's virtual conference, Countering the Darkness, continues. You can still sign up, get 90 days full access to two dozen presentations, including the final conference presentation by Dr. Tom Horn. This also gets, as a free bonus, you would get uh, access to all six Skywatch Films documentaries, all for one price. Again, 90 days access you watch on your schedule. You can find out more and sign up for instant access at DefenderConference.com. That's DefenderConference.com. Com. This week on Skywatch TV, we're talking about the image of the beast and how artificial intelligence, generative AI, and deep fake technology, deep fakes, could be used to give life to the image of the beast. Joe Artis Horn got this, uh, he credits a, a download, basically divine inspiration, not of his own wisdom. And to me, this is one of the most plausible scenarios I've heard yet and this is something we've been studying for a very long time. Don't miss the program. This is all about the new book, Summoning the Demon, a quote from Elon Musk regarding the creation of autonomous artificial intelligence. Joe Artis Horn, Ali Anderson, the co-authors with the late Tom Horn, who worked on this manuscript prior to his death. And uh, you can watch the program right now at skywatchtv.com. All of our video content is always at the home page. You can also find it right now at our Roku or Apple TV uh, channels. If you've got a set-top box, make sure you've got the Skywatch TV app included there. You can catch it right now over the air. Our broadcast schedule posted skywatchtv.com slash channels. It's also at Rumble, rumble.com slash skywatchtv. And of course, our free mobile app, which brings all of our video content right into your smartphone or tablet, whether it's iOS, Android, or Amazon Kindle Fire. We've got links to the app stores posted for your convenience at skywatchtv.com slash app. Now, Sharon and I are planning a trip to Israel beginning May 6th, the one-week tour of Israel, May 6th through 13th, to bear witness to what has happened since October 7th with our own eyes and not through the filter of Western media. Got some pushback from the uh, comments yesterday about Tucker Carlson and his interview, and that's fine. 
But it is really interesting how this issue, the war since October 7th, the six-month conflict between Israel and Hamas, is dividing the body of Christ over Israel's response. And sadly, a lot of it has to do with Hamas and its willingness to use innocent civilians, Muslim, Christian, whoever happens to be available as human shields. We plan to go to communities in the South that were attacked on October 7th, including Sturot, a couple of the kibbutzim, and visit with IDF soldiers who are being rotated out from Gaza. We'll go to Tel Aviv, visit Hostage Square, the Nova Music Festival exhibit in Israel. We'll visit the Temple Mount, the Mount of Olives, the Western Wall, the tunnels, and of course, a couple of museums, including the uh, Israel Museum, which has an absolute, just a very powerful memorial of, of the Holocaust. Uh, this is eye-opening, and we plan to pray all along the way. We hope you'll consider joining us. We know it's uh, growing short. This is short notice, May 6th through 13th. If you're interested, you can find out more information at uh, our personal website. That's gilberthouse.org slash travel, gilberthouse.org slash travel. Thank you for watching as we keep watch. I'm Derek Gilbert. This is 5 in 10 from Skywatch TV.